Listen, I'm old enough to remember when a shoot interview was an old timer in a crappy hotel room being recorded by an even crappier camera with audio quality that was so bad you could just about hear the wrestler telling yet another story about how the honky tonk man was an absolute dick over the sound of the whirring of the crappy camera recording it. However, in the year 2021, it's now mostly done on very good sounding audio podcast or in actual interviews. And with a wrestling war going on between AEW and WWE, there are often jibes being thrown in both directions. And with WWE cutting so much talent this year, you can bet dollars to donuts that there were some spicy takes to be shared. So as the year runs out this clock, let's look back at some of the explosive interviews from 2021. Hopefully more explosive than the end of AEW Revolution tee hee. I'm Luke Hailing from Parts of Unknown, and these are the 10 most explosive shoot interviews of 2021. What's that? You're not subscribed? Well, do it, you dick. Number 10, Eddie Kingston says WWE doesn't listen to their fans. I know what you're thinking and or typing. Luke, this is a list about shoot interview and that is not a shoot interview. I know, but please bear with me here. What began as simply a fun promo to send the crowd home happy after an episode of Dynamite turned into Eddie Kingston giving a big rallying to the troop speech, preaching that WWE doesn't listen to their fans and that you will not find the heart of the AEW locker room in WWE. The competition. Sometimes doesn't want to hear their fans. AEW cares about their fans. You saw a match between Kenny Omega and my dude Jungle Boy that you will not see on the other channel. You will not see legends who are respected on the other channel. You will not see people like me and my best friend on the other channel. And you will not see the heart that everybody in that locker room has on the other channel. The promo gained traction online very quickly because wrestling fans plus Twitter equals discourse. But this served as one of the strongest examples of an AEW performer speaking out against WWE in front of an AEW crowd. And you're right, comments, AEW do take too many shots against WWE and WWE never do it back. Number nine, Roman Reigns takes a shot at AEW. Roman Reigns is about as much of a company guy for WWE as you will find these days. He plays his role extremely exceptionally well. He's been universal champion for well over a year, and now that he's a heel, we're cheering him. Wrestling fans are weird, aren't we? And in an interview with Complex, he showed just how much of a company man he was by saying AEW really isn't competition. I don't see the real competition with AEW because I think their fan base legitimately is a hardcore fan base. So there's like a ceiling and built in ground to that viewership. WWE is trying to connect with everyone. We're trying to connect with the mainstream. We're trying to pull in the casual fan. We're trying to engage the new viewer while also servicing our hardcore fan base and give them compelling stories to fulfill them as well. As far as competition, not to me. AEW has thrived off taking shots at WWE and fair enough, it's a large reason why the company is so popular. And it's nice to see wrestlers on the other side of the fence throwing a bit of shade back. After all, it's a bit of fun at the end of the day. Number eight, Sin Cara was told his character was dead. There are only three things guaranteed in life, death, taxes, and who cares about the third one? We're talking about death. Specifically, the death of Sin Cara, the character, may he rest in peace. While the man who wrestles as Sin Cara in WWE is still alive and very much well, the same cannot be said for the character of Sin Cara, at least according to Paul Heyman. Speaking with Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful, under his new ring name Sinta de Oro, Sin Cara revealed just what the hell was up with that two-week Catalina angle. You should remember that one. You know, where Sin Cara randomly had a lady door partner who then just disappeared. They were trying to push Andrade and, and Selena Vega during that time. Oh, so they brought wow. Catalina with me to help with the storyline that, that was going on. And I actually thought that they were, they were, I was going to continue having this young lady with me, you know, yes. over uh, the course maybe of a year to build something up. And then all of a sudden they, they told me, no, we're only going to bring her here for a few, few weeks. Once it's over, it's done. And I was really? like, okay. And then, so what's next after that? What's next for me? What am I going to do? Am I supposed to just sit around again and wait or... That was, I think, the one of the, the things that made me decide that I wanted to, you know, leave the company, that I was done with the company because uh, I, I asked a few people, like, what's the future holds for me? What, do you guys have any plans for me? What's going on? And nobody would give me a straight answer. Uh, Paul Heyman told me a straight answer. He said that Sin Cara was dead. That's what he told me. 
This certainly gives us a look into what the backstage WWE atmosphere is like for someone like Sin Cara who had little going on during his last few years with the company and the frustrations that are felt when creative tells you they simply don't have anything for you. Or maybe they do, it's just to get over someone else and it'll only last a couple of weeks. You're dead! Number seven, Lady Frost was told that she was too old for WWE. One of WWE's biggest changes this year, hey, <laughs> someone should do a list on that, is that the reason NXT 1.0 didn't appeal to those darn kids on my lawn is because the women on the show were too bloody old. Following her release, Frankie Monet tweeted that one of the reasons she was let go was because she was shockingly 38. Ugh, get in the ground already, Grandma. Even though, you know, Bobby Lashley was WWE champion for most of the year and he's 45. And he feuded for most of the summer against Goldberg, who's 54. And Big E, the current WWE champion, is just three years younger than Monet. Yay, double standards! This new hiring policy is also why we won't be seeing Lady Frost in WWE. Following a WWE trial, she was told explicitly she wouldn't be hired because, being in her early 30s, she was way too old. I think at the end of the day, I don't know what happened. Uh, someone told me that I was too old when I worked uh, the next set of like extra work. I did another loop after that, after they told me no. So I was like, this is weird. They're calling me back again. Um, and it was Scott Armstrong that was like, sorry. He's like, not to be disrespectful. You look great. Like just as good as like the young ones, but we're not hiring people of your age. And I was like, all right, see you later. I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm doing things that 20 year olds would be doing anyway. And not that that matters, but I think it's it's disheartening because it's something that I can't change. I can't work on, I can't get better. It's not, hey, practice in the mirror for your promo or hey, go take Lucha classes, go take this. I, I, I literally have no control over that. Well, I guess that also means I won't be getting my shot in WWE. Oh no, wait, I'm a man. I've still got another 20 years or so yet. <laughs> Yay, double standards. Number six, Adam Cole didn't know his WWE contract was expiring. Do you remember when WWE let the contract of one of their potential biggest future stars in the company expired and didn't realize it? It is wild, isn't it? And it will remain wild because how do you just forget about the contract of Adam goddamn Cole, baby? But in the defense of WWE, WWE, Adam Cole Bay Bay didn't know either. As he explained in the post All Out Media Scrum, he was under the impression that he was under contract with WWE for another six months. So it was a surprise to me, it was a surprise to them. Um, and then all of a sudden, I went from thinking, okay, uh, you know, December is when I'm going to start talking about a new contract. Uh, and then it was like, oh no, we're talking about it in three days. Um, so then I know it was, it was public knowledge to a lot of people that I had um, signed a little extension. I was in the middle of a really serious angle with Kyle O'Reilly, which was very important to me. He's one of my best friends in the entire world. Um, and then after that is, is when stuff kind of opened up for me. So, but yeah, very surprising to me. It was just as surprising to me. Isn't Adam Cole just the nicest man in pro wrestling? Number five, Maria Kanellis shoots on WWE's treatment of female stars and Stephanie McMahon. It's wild to think that ROH is basically sort of gone now. One of the biggest pillars of the independent wrestling scene for nearly 20 years is in this bizarre state of limbo, releasing all of its top stars, which opened the door for Jay Lethal to walk straight into AEW. And apparently the Briscoes and Matt Taven have been seen backstage at Dynamite as well. And the reason why this is so wild to me is that just a few months earlier, we had Maria Kanellis Bennett on our show to talk about the women's division that she was building in Ring of Honor. And following on from Mickie James revealing that she was told that there wouldn't be an Evolution 2 because no one really wanted it, Maria took WWE and Stephanie McMahon to task. Since the beginning of my career, 17 years ago, I just know that fans clamor for women's wrestling. I mean, they wanted to see our pillow fights back then, They want, but they also wanted to see, you know, Lita and Trish having an awesome match or Melina and Michelle McCool doing things that they, you know, that were considered too much like the guys. The fans want to see women's wrestling. And the whole idea that it doesn't sell is crazy to me. I don't know how Stephanie McMahon deals with that. If I had that much power, oh my, there would be a, a whole show plus a reality show that covers the actual girls' lives. Plus on top of that, we would have a makeup line. We would be on the cover of Vogue showing, guess what? These women, they're badasses and they're beautiful in their own right. I want my girls to have those opportunities that I didn't have in such a large company like WWE. I see all these things that Stephanie is fighting for women's rights. 
but it seems more promotional than it does actual. And that is what I, I'm curious. I'm curious about that. Look, I mean, she's not wrong, is she? Hang on a minute, she's 39. Ugh, get in a home already. Number four, Brian Danielson shoots on WWE's budget cuts. Brian Danielson has probably been the most positive former WWE star towards WWE of anyone to leave or be fired from the company this year. He often says that he loved his time there and he loves Vince McMahon, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't have an issue with the budget cuts that have seen WWE release almost 80 wrestlers in 2021 alone. Yeah, despite all of those profits. Speaking with Ariel Hawani, Danielson said that while he understands that WWE is a business and profits are what matter most to businesses, it's not right to release people that were only signed so other promotions couldn't have them and then claim it's because of budget cuts. They signed a lot of people to high-end contracts when AEW kind of started to keep people from going to AEW or whatever it is. Uh, but then they realized like, oh, well, AEW can't sign all these people. So now the people that have too many high-end contracts or whatever it is, if they feel like they're getting paid more than they should be getting paid, they'll let them go or whatever it is. But you offered them a contract to be with you for three years or whatever. If you overpaid them, that's your bad and you're still a very profitable company. It's an argument that we've been making on the WrestleTalk podcast since the launch of AEW. WWE have spent the last few years hoarding talent and now they're reaping what they sow. The problem is that these are real people with real lives that they uprooted for your real panic hoarding because of a little competition. And there is one man who was a big part of the 140 odd names released over the last couple of years. Number three, Nick Khan explains those WWE releases. It's very rare that we see top brass of WWE doing very public interviews. However, we got that this year as WWE President Nick Khan, a man arguably more powerful in WWE than Vinnie Mac himself, sat down with Ariel Halwani of BT Sports and the topic of those mass releases came up, leaving Khan to explain why so many talents were being cut. I don't know that there's one explanation for it. I think ultimately what's looked at is, is this person for us going to move the needle now or in the imminent future? So, by the way, we had a tryout, a two-day tryout in Las Vegas, which ended yesterday, which Triple H and Johnny Laurinaitis and Bruce Prichard were all across, as were the rest of us. Um, we've signed over a dozen new talent coming out of that tryout, and I'm not suggesting, oh, that's why we cut the other talent, but we're always looking for what's next. We live in the present, we live in the future. We don't live in the past. So when people leave and they move on with their life and their careers, that's good by us. For us, it's what works for us and our product at that moment in time. And again, what's gonna work down the road and largely in part, the existing roster is based on that. The answer sort of makes sense, as does the we've just signed 12 new names argument. But are you telling me that you couldn't move the needle with Keith Lee, Hit Row, Alistair Black, or, you know, Bray Wyatt, who was actually moving the needle in terms of your merchandise sales? On top of that, you didn't give half of them a chance to move the needle. Hit Row were on TV for three weeks, had one match, then you cut them. Nick Khan is a businessman, and he will give a businessman answer to the businessman questions. But truthfully, I don't think there's an answer he could have given that would have satisfied fans. Number two, The Undertaker thinks wrestling is soft. Insert old man yelling at cloud picture. Now, yes, The Undertaker is a legend and his opinion should be respected as such. However, his appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast certainly rubbed a few people the wrong way because when Rogan asked him if he watched wrestling currently, he said that he struggled with it and called the product soft. The product has changed so much. It's kind of soft. To the young guys, oh, he's, you know, he's a bitter old guy. Yeah, right. I'm not bitter. I, I did my time. I'm, I'm good. I walked away when I wanted to walk away. I just think the product is, is a little, uh, a little soft. There's guys, there's obviously, there's guys here and there that, that have an edge to them. Uh, but there's, there's, there's too much pretty, not enough substance, I think, right now. Now, that would be one thing, but he also said that he thinks the business was better when guys carried knives and guns instead of Nintendo Switches. And you know, I don't recall anyone ever getting shanked over playing Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. Taker said, in that era of guys too, men were men. You go into a dressing room today and it's a lot different. I remember walking into my first real dressing room, half of them had knives and guns in their bags. Sh got handled then. Now you walk in there and there's guys playing video games and making sure they look pretty. It's evolution, I guess. I don't know what it is, but I just like those eras, man. I liked when men were men.
To say this quote got the wrestling world talking is an understatement, with even WWE stars themselves calling it out. And I'm sure there will be some of you watching this video that agree with Taker, but let me just remind you that in a time when men were men, they also died before they were 30. Damien Priest turns 40 next year and he's in a lot better shape than Davey Boy Smith was at his age. You know, in a time when men were men, there's a lot less wrestlers dying young these days. And if that's because they're playing Splatoon in a locker room instead of wanking off their guns, then so be it. And number one, Andrade dishes the Charlotte dirt. It's been a funny old year for Charlotte Flair. She had that feud where it was insinuated that her dad impregnated someone her age. She had a shoot fight with Nia Jax on TV and was part of the now infamous belt exchange angle on SmackDown where she went into business for herself on live TV, had a verbal altercation backstage and was escorted from the building. So it's easy to forget that when he left WWE, Andrade El Idolo did this massive interview with Lucha Libre Online where he dished a whole bunch of dirt and explained that Charlotte Flair was taken off WrestleMania because of a misdiagnosed pregnancy by WWE doctors. And also, women in the company were jealous of her. He said, there is a lot of jealousy towards her. There are a lot of female wrestlers in WWE, but only three or four can wrestle for 20 minutes. A lot of them complain about her getting opportunities. They look at her as just the daughter of Ric Flair. I know she's a good wrestler. She earned her spot in WWE. There is a lot of jealousy. After her matches, a lot of people say she works stiff. Wonder if Nia Jax also thinks that. Flair actually confirmed that misdiagnosed pregnancy story, but what was even more shocking than all of that though, was Andrade accusing someone in WWE of taking photos of Charlotte Flair while she was getting undressed without her consent. He said, we know who, but she didn't want to say anything and WWE didn't know about it. I mean, f hell. So that's our list. That was 10 of the most explosive shoot interviews from 2021. What were your favorites or did you think we missed any? Let us know in the comments down below and check out our other wrestling lists on screen. Right there, those ones. Click them right now. I've been Luke Owen. Jam that jam.